Welcome everybody to Chemistry 105, General Organic and Biological Chemistry. Uh, this will be our first chapter in the series for the summer course, Chapter 1, Chemistry in Our Lives. Section 1.1, Chemistry and Chemicals, is literally just these two terms defined. In Obviously, we need to start off with what is chemistry. Chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. Matter is any substance that has mass and takes up space. Chemistry studies the composition, structure, properties of, and reactions of matter. And that's what this course will very quickly go through in all of the major realms of chemistry. And chemicals are any substance that has the same composition and properties wherever it is found. What this means is that water, for example, is always water. Whether you get the water from the ocean, from a river, a lake, a stream, a brook, tap water, from sweat, from a bottled water source, from a spring, from a geyser, from space, whatever whether it's purified or not in certain ways, it's still water. Water is always, always, always H2O. No matter the source. And I wanted to go back to chemistry, the, the term up above, um, with this term matter in there. And that's a critical uh, and importance to this topic is what is matter? You might think that everything is matter because everything seems to have mass and take up space. Everything you see certainly is. But that is not actually true. There are things that are not a type of matter. For example, light is not matter. Oops. Light is not matter, or heat is not matter. Um, what else? Your thoughts, they do not matter. Just kidding. They might matter, but they're not a form of matter. Um, and there's electricity, so on and so forth. There are examples of things that do exist that we utilize in our everyday lives, but that are not forms of matter. However, most things that we need to consider are, in our daily lives, are forms of matter. Section 1-2 here is the scientific method, and it's uh, thinking like a scientist. Now, this is probably something you have learned in middle school or high school, or maybe already in other college courses, but it is just a refresher here in chapter 1. What is the scientific method? Um, this is a, a method that all scientists adhere to when doing their research, trying to understand nature and the way of life. Um, and it starts with observations being made or having previous knowledge. Your book will just say observations, but that's not really that true. Um, most people that do research have some prior knowledge about how chemistry works or how biology works or physics works and they want to solve a new problem that hasn't been solved before. How can I make this known chemical, let's say Taxol, how can I make Taxol, which is an anti-cancer drug, how can I make that quicker and cheaper or how can I make it more pure? Those are questions that a typical chemist might ask, ask about something. And so you take that previous knowledge of A, what is its structure, and B, how is it made in the past? How long does it take to make it? What is its percent yield? Things like that. And then your other prior knowledge of, you know, just in general, how chemical reactions work. Maybe you can design a new way to make this. So you make a hypothesis at that point. I think I can make Taxol quicker, cheaper, and in fewer steps with better yield than in previous methods by 
utilizing such and such reaction. And this is how it would work. All right, that's just a hypothesis though. That doesn't really mean anything. Um, it's just like, for example, about one out of 10,000 known chemicals that are made for the purpose of medicine actually get approved by the FDA to be used as medicines. One out of 10,000. And there's probably 10,000 for um, other chemicals that never even got to the stage of testing by the FDA. But you make the hypothesis that I think this drug, this chemical, will improve the daily life of blah, 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 of let's say a person with Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. This chemical will help these patients by increasing their lung function or something like that. And then you go and test it in a human and it doesn't work. So you have to retest your hypothesis. Um, but that's f further on along in this process. So you make the hypothesis, then you determine how to prove the hypothesis or disprove it by designing an experiment. So you run the experiment, and while you're running the experiment, you collect data. <clears throat> the data can be quantitative or qualitative, and quantitative just means that it can be um, analyzed numerically. Quantitative. Or qualitative can mean that it is a quality of it, not numbers. So for example, what color is it? What shape is it? Um, things like that. Those are qualities of a substance, not quantities. Once you have done the experiment and you've collected your data, you can then analyze the data. You need to make sure it is proving or disproving your hypothesis. If the data supports the hypothesis, you need to retest the experiment multiple times in order to make sure that no mistakes were made and that this is really true. If the data does not support the hypothesis, you need to go back and alter the hypothesis in a way so that your, your test is proving a hypothesis. And if your testing, your experimentation just shows that this was complete malarkey, it's not gonna work, there's no possible way to do this, then you just need to start with something completely different and do a completely unrelated experiment. If you have 4A there where your data is supporting your hypothesis though, you need to publish your information. And this is done so that the rest of the chemical world or physical or biological or whatever you're publishing in knows your data. Do, does every chemist need to know every single uh, publication ever? No. But if someone al along the way in the future needs to do a reaction that, say, I've already done and proven to work in such a way, they don't need to waste their time repeating my experiment. They can just take the information and go along with it and use the data in their experimentation. It's for the better of everybody so that we're not wasting money, wasting time, wasting resources, and so on and so forth. Um, then if that all works out and multiple people do multiple studies on the same general idea, and it always is shown to be correct, you can get a law. And a law is something that is a known fact based upon multiple iterations of research that prove it to be the case. An example of a law would be the law of gravity, which states that, you know, in simple terms, if I throw an object up in the air, it will come back down. Always. This has never been disproven because Earth has a massive gravitational force. Um, and, or the we have in chemistry the law of conservation of mass, which says that mass 
can neither be created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. Things don't just pop up out of nowhere. They must come from somewhere, and that somewhere had to exist in the first place. Uh, but you also have theories that can be made based upon um, these studies. And theories are explanations or models used to rationalize phenomena. They're not something that you can say is definitive proof, and this is always the case. Uh, so for example, we do have the law of gravity, but there is a theory of gravity that, you, that tries to explain how, when I throw up a baseball, how it comes back down. And you could look at Albert Einstein's, uh, I think his special theory of relativity that tries to explain how gravity works. We know it works, it's a law, but the rationale behind it is the theory, something you can't really prove. Um, for example, Einstein said that the way gravity works is that we have these objects in space that have mass and therefore gravitational forces. And they create these gravity waves that behave like a trampoline, the, the like part you jump on on a trampoline. And if, I, if you imagine yourself standing on a trampoline, where you're standing is going to dip down below the outside part of the trampoline. And if you were to put a ball on the outside part of the trampoline, it would roll towards your feet. And Einstein used this explanation to describe how the planets are orbiting the sun and how the moon is orbiting the earth and stuff like that. We're in some space-time continuum trampoline fabric-y field and the our weight, so to say, our masses are pushing that space-time continuum down which brings things that have mass near us towards us. That's a theory. There's no way to prove that because we can't see these the fabrics of the cosmos, as it's called, but um, it is used and you can apply numbers to it, equations and such that can show it to maybe be correct, but there's no real way to really say for sure that this is true. Section 1.3, Studying and Learning Chemistry. This section here in the book just kind of gives you ideas and how to study for this class. My suggestion is to just read it. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time in these lectures um, telling you how to learn because really you are the best person to um, at telling yourself how to study. Um, if you're not doing the work, you're not going to do well. That's all there is to it. You need to know how to do the work uh, best for yourself in order to succeed though.